Wonderful. So, welcome everyone to the presentation of my thesis. As you can see, uh, the title is The Metamorphosis of the Creative Ego. Well, I have to admit that this wasn't exactly the first uh, slide that I had in mind for the presentation. Since I work in advertising and uh, I deal with the ego a lot, this was the, the first slide that I had in mind. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I had to stick with the, with the template, so... so uh, Getting back on track now and becoming serious, uh, what my hypothesis is, is that um, uh, creative egos uh, really need to undergo substantial changes in order to survive in the new media era. Because the risk is uh, a big one, and in order to avoid sinking, I believe that not only we need to change our mentality, we need to change the structure in which we work daily. And uh, it's not an easy task, but it's definitely a necessary one. And um, in order to see how this change needs to take place, and uh, since it's such a complex subject, the ones concerning the ego, uh, we need to look a little bit into uh, the origins of the ego, in terms of uh, uh, what it is, when it was first detected, how it influenced uh, people, uh, and how it changes during our lifetime, and how it influenced society as well. So, what is... Uh, ego. Uh, simply put, ego is uh, a way that we express ourselves. It's a word that comes from Latin, I am, but the paradox uh, I think that hides behind the definition of the ego is that it's something that's determined and defined by others, not by ourselves. We express ourselves, but it's others who really define what our ego is. For example, I uh, choose the tapestry of my apartment, the furniture, the lights, and when somebody comes to visit me, all of a sudden they judge my persona, so they judge my ego based on the way I expressed it. And this is sort of a paradox because we can say that uh, every definition of an ego is biased because it's filtered through the experiences and the knowledge and the backgrounds of uh, uh, the people that actually put forward this definition. In terms of when uh, uh, ego was born, uh, there is a fascinating theory, I know uh, Dave loves this slide, and uh, um, it's a theory uh, put forward it's by... Italy, exactly, <laughs> exactly. No, it's a theory put forward by Steve Taylor in a book called The Fall, and uh, he maintains that this change from collective uh, approach to life to an individual approach came about about 6,000 years ago. 4000 BC, when uh, um, human beings ceased to adopt communal burials and started to adopt individual burials. This was the very moment in which uh, men ceased to feel a sense of community, be it their family, their tribe, their clan, and started to support the individualistic approach to life. Another important question to answer to is, do we all have an ego? And the answer is yes. Uh, the closer a human being can get not to have an ego is uh, a pathology, what psychiatrists define as a psychosis. And uh, a great example of, of such a personality is Woody Allen in the movie Zelig. And these people do all their best to uh, become like chameleons, to behave exactly like the people that surround them, and in a way to annihilate themselves and thus their ego. But this is just an extreme, so let's focus now on the, on the general characteristics of, uh, of the ego. Um, does our ego stay the same during our lifetime? This is another important question, and the answer is no, it changes all the time. For instance, the ego that I had when I first started working in advertising is very different from the ego that I have nowadays. Uh, but let's look at an example that's, that's really clarifying for, for this point. Uh, and uh, let's talk about Picasso. He went from uh, uh, a frightening and um, timorous ego during his uh, uh, blue period to a more cheerful and energetic ego during his rose period. Then again, he moved to an eclectic and versatile ego during his African influence period. And uh, finally, he embraced a more multifaceted and uh, unpredictable ego when uh, he got into the uh, Cubist period. So our ego does change during our lifetime. But if we take one day, like today, is our ego the same all throughout the day? 
Not at all. And this is what makes the subject even more complex. It's not the same because if we imagine our life to be like a, a pie and our day divided in slices, we can be very different from one scenario to another. For instance, we can be very prepotent and dominating on the workplace, but then we can be very weak and intimidated when we get home. So uh, during the day, our ego really uh, goes through different phases. And uh, another example to make it clear is uh, for me uh, an epitome of how the ego changes through uh, a certain moment is Maradona. Maradona, who is, uh, uh, as we all know, a godlike figure, somebody who is embraced and loved by the masses, a genius on the soccer field, but then when he gets off the soccer field, he becomes a little fragile and weak, as we can see from this picture. So, you know, it's a, a just a position between two personalities uh, in the same moment, really. Now, um, what is it that nourishes our ego? What is it that fosters it? Let's listen to this brief clip from uh, Walt Whitman, Songs of Myself. I think I could turn and live with animals. They are so placid and self-contained. I stand and look at them long and long. They do not sweat and whine about their condition. They do not lie awake in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick discussing their duty to God. Not one is dissatisfied. Not one is demented with the mania of owning things. Now, the mania of owning things, so consumerism, materialism, the very concept of private property, uh, these are the factors that really uh, nourish our ego and make it come out and stand out, really. And uh, um, the concept of status symbol has always been something that men uh, adopted through their life, starting from wanting to have the best bone knife, the most resistant tent, uh, the prettier decorative feather from a bird. Uh, it's always been a concept embraced by men. But uh, in the last century, somebody was able to transform uh, this concept from a, a tendency into a vigorous crave, and thus transforming our culture from a culture based on needs to a culture based on desire. And I want to touch on this because I think that this is very relevant because uh, um, it uh, really it's a concept that's interwoven with the ego development. The person who was able to make this change, and somebody already talked about him yesterday, is Edward Bernays. Um, he's uh, Sigmund Freud's nephew, and the interesting uh, thing about him is that uh, he worked during World War II for the American government, because he was living in the States, and uh, he worked, uh, and his uh, task was to promote America's war aims in the media. And he did this very successfully. When war was over, he, he thought, if I can apply propaganda to times of war, I can certainly apply it to times of peace. So as we saw, he changed the name from propaganda to public relations because Germans uh, threw a bad light on the term. And uh, he um, started analyzing his uncle's uh, introduction to psychoanalysis, and uh, he departed from his psychological approach. And uh, the insight that he was able to concentrate on is that human beings beings are not only moved by information and facts, but mostly by their inner desires. And he played on this insight uh, in a major way, creating, literally creating demand for goods in the United States. And being the United States a country with an incredible surplus of production, that was a clever idea. Um, I just want to touch on the first uh, anecdote, the first episode of his life uh, as uh, a man of propaganda in peace times. He uh, was hired by the American Tobacco Society and his task was to make cigarettes popular among women, which was a tough task at the time. Uh, so what he did, he uh, related those cigarettes to a symbol of freedom. He, he created the slogan, Torches of Freedom, that was related to these products, and um, he organized, he hired a few debutants, and during the traditional Easter parade in New York, he had them walk among normal people, and all of a sudden get out cigarettes and light them up, and photographers were there, and this news made the media, because it was a scandal at the time to see women smoking, and the Torches of Freedom became the unconscious motto of every woman picking up a cigarette since then. It was a big success and it's just the first episode of what we today call consumerism. Now, uh, after looking at the history of the ego and uh, uh, 
uh, after having seen what nourishes it, really, I want to get closer to uh, my world, to the world of advertising, which has a lot to do with consumerism, by the way. This is a, a poster that uh, witnesses that campaign that uh, brought women to be very close to cigarettes at the time. Um, let's get close to the world of advertising, because consumerism has a lot to do with it. And... Uh, uh, one important question that we have to ask ourselves when we talk about the ego in advertising is why is it so much talked about? Why do people always talk about inflated ego when they talk about advertising? Well, I think uh, uh, advertising gives more room to personal expression than many other jobs. Like if you are working in a bank or if you are a worker, what you produce doesn't have in itself such a, a big part of you. Uh, it's often uh, said that creatives, when they create an idea, that idea is a child to them. It's like a, uh, a mini version of themselves, you know? And so, uh, this is why it's so difficult to deal with an ego in advertising. And this is why criticisms to ideas are often taken personally, and there is a blur between the persona and the idea, which is the, a big mistake, because of course, uh, it's a mistake that originates from the fact that we think that that idea is part of ourselves. So, uh, first lesson that we need to know is to detach from ideas because, uh, you know, uh, criticism to ideas are not criticism to ourselves. Now, uh, uh, I divided the history of advertising very roughly, since we don't have much time, in two phases, the pre-New Media era and the post-New Media era. How did it work before New Media came about? Usually, you had the dynamic duo, composed by a copywriter and an art director, who got a brief from a client, and as we all know, they went away for a week, and they stayed in the, in the intimacy of their office, and they reappeared after a week with an enlightened solution for the client. Now, this was a time in which uh, uh, creative personalities ruled uh, the world of advertising. You often could see clients that moved from one agency to another just following the creative director because the charisma of such characters was more important than the structure. And uh, um, this was a time... Uh, um, in which uh, the importance of the man at the top in a creative agency was predominant. The epitome of this character is uh, so very well depicted in uh, a madman, and it's Don Draper. Now, I want you to listen to this little clip, because uh, this clip is about uh, a moment in which Sterling and Cooper prompted Don Draper to drop a client, in this case an airline client, and the response that the client gives when he's dumped is really significant to show how important creatives were at the time. Sterling Cooper has decided to end its relationship with Milwaukee Airlines. Sterling Cooper? I'm sorry, it wasn't my decision. You know, when we came in there, they all said, Sterling Cooper is Don Draper. That's what you get. So Sterling Cooper is Don Draper. So there was really a, an identification of an agency with a person, which is not the case anymore. Now, uh, we have to keep in mind, of course, that uh, advertising is just a reflection of society. So in those times, uh, and even uh, in the later uh, decades, individualism was very prominent and we see it uh, in, uh, in the events that the community embraced, you know, the, the laws on abortion, the laws on divorce, these are all statements, are all significant signs of a society uh, whose tendency is to value me more than we. And this was the case up until 15-20 uh, years ago. Now, we all know uh, what happened uh, in the, on the media scenario. This is just a map that highlights how things changed so dramatically in the last 15 years and how many new media channels uh, mm, uh, were born. And uh, um, this, uh, uh, these changes really affected every process of advertising, from the uh, client relationship to agency structure, from uh, strategic approaches to creative processes, from production techniques to media channels. Everything was affected. And all of a sudden, we found our ourselves uh, in a real inadequate position, because all of a sudden, the um, job skills required to us were not the job skills that we were able to deliver. 
Uh, now, why and what uh, made this change come about? It was technology, as we all know. And technology, applied to the concept of consumerism that was created by Bernays, uh, gave to consumers a huge power. Up until 15 years ago, consumers could just uh, satisfy their inner needs by buying a product or another. Now, consumers got the chance to be heard to provoke, to demand, and even to influence uh, companies' um, strategies. And uh, um, this moment is very well summarized by the 2006 cover of the Time magazine, electing you, the consumer, as the person of the year. So in this uh, moment uh, uh, in which we realize that we are not adequate for the job anymore, what do we do? There is a vacuum and it needs to be filled. Uh, this, in this moment I turned to my primary research because I wanted to survey, to see how people uh, reacted to this scenario and how they tried to adapt to it, how they tried to adapt to modern times. So, uh, going to my primary research, what I did is um, I tried to set two very precise goals. The first one was to establish how present the ego is in people's minds in every phase of advertising and the second thing I was interested in is, uh, was to help draw conclusions on how the agency structure should be. Because as I said, I think that it's not enough to change your mentality, you have to work in an environment that fosters that new mentality. Um, in order to do so, and since the phenomenon that, that I was trying to study is so intimate and somehow philosophical, I uh, didn't go uh, for a depthless uh, uh, amount of data, that's the one that I could have uh, received from surveys. I chose in-depth interviews. And uh, by doing so, I chose 20 professionals from uh, um, around the world, because I wanted uh, my research to have more of an international than a mere, than a mere local taste and uh, so I interviewed 20 professionals and the cluster that I chose is creative leaders with considerable experience in large advertising organizations structured in international networks. Now, um, of course, when you, when you set your goals on something there can always be criticism, so I just would like to uh, briefly address a couple of those possible criticisms. One could be that, you know, I just focused uh, on networks but there's a much vaster number of structures out there. Well, that's true, but I think that networks, because of their mastodontic structures, their crystallized uh, malfunctions and their absurd bureaucracies are really the toughest scenario to deal with. In other words, if you can change an agency of a network, you can change any, any agency. And uh, uh, another possible uh, criticism is that creative leaders are just a small part of reality of an advertising agency. Well, this is true in a way because the pipeline that goes from receiving a brief to delivering a campaign is a long one and it involves people from different uh, backgrounds and uh, uh, different departments, but uh, it's undoubtedly the creative leader figure, the one that's the most important in an agency. And this is because ideas are what make the difference, uh, not numbers. So I think that uh, creative leaders are uh, key not only because they come up with great ideas but because they have the ability to judge ideas from other people and to make them better and mostly because they go and fight for these ideas in front of clients. A less possible criticism could be that advertising is a business, so you should have concentrated on tangible numbers rather than on impalpable mentalities. Well, uh, concentrating on tangible numbers is just what, what big networks have been doing in the last 10 years, and uh, this uh, led them to the verge of uh, a disaster, really, because um, focusing on business is not the right solution. We need to have a vision, or, as Paul Verdun used to say, a dream with a deadline. And instead, uh, what we've been doing, uh, I work for McCann, but every big network I have been doing so, uh, is focusing on numbers first and on ideas secondly. And I think the, the way we can come out from this impasse is only through the mentality of people. So I think that uh, what people think is really fundamental. Now, um, the, the studying the history of the ego, analyzing uh, the history of advertising and uh, interviewing these people gave me uh, some results that are summarized in uh, the solutions that I tried to put forward. Um, and let's look into them. Uh, as we saw, this new media scenario uh, created a different approach to communication. So from a dependent situation in which the brand was talking to the consumers to an interdependent situation in which there's a dialogue between consumers and brands. 
agencies have to mirror this uh, structure and so even agencies pass from being dependent with a vertical structure to an horizontal one. But the problem of interdependence is that it naturally leads to complexity because one thing is leading a team and telling them what to do. Another thing is sitting down with people from different backgrounds and trying to understand from them what's the best way to proceed. So you know there's conflicts there, there there's a, it's a difficult process and complexity leads to uncertainty because I deal with people who know things that I don't know. So I have to be very humble in order to uh, absorb what they have to say and in order to make it into a better solution for the agency and for the clients. Now, there's a, in front of this vacuum, there are two ways, two possible reactions. One reaction is to keep thinking that we know it all, that we don't need to learn anything. And this is the reaction that, again, the big networks undertook. Uh, the, the line of thought is the following, I don't know anything about digital, no problem, I'll create a unit that takes care of digital and I'll still be the boss. I don't know anything about events, no worries, I'll create a unit that takes care of events and I'll, be, I'll still be the boss. So, I find this to be uh, the, the, the less pathetic attempt of the ego to survive in modern times. And uh, it's really uh, a, pl a plug for, for the advertising industry, I think, because it, showed, it shows a very short-sighted view, a very limited view on things. And this is summarized by this picture, I think. You know, uh, uh, just not looking far ahead, but just sticking to your own ground and your own little world. Now, uh, uh, this is also uh, something that will very rapidly uh, bring uh, uh, absolute leaders, transform absolute leaders in obsolete managers. And this is what happening, what's happening with many of the people who didn't embrace the change. Now, the other possible reaction to this vacuum is to embrace this change, to understand that as uh, um, Barry Liebert and John Spector brilliantly uh, stated in their book, we are smarter than me. If you start with this mentality, everything is possible and uh, results will come naturally. Now, the important thing is that before even starting to embrace this philosophy, we have to get rid of the old school mechanisms, because our head is engulfed with a lot of information that comes from our previous previous years and that's not relevant anymore. So we literally need to take out of our brain information and start from scratch. Um, now, uh, another way um, of looking at it is that we can't deal with a non-pre-existent scenario with a pre-existent mentality. It would be like trying to write an email using a typewriter, so it just doesn't apply. We need to get rid of uh, all the information that it's engulfing our heads. Another way to look uh, at it, a very interesting one, is one that's, that's uh, brought forward by Alex Boguski. I had the, the luck to meet him a couple of months ago and, and uh, he brought forward a, a very interesting uh, theory. Uh, which is that we need to behave like children. Why? Uh, he sees the, the biggest problem of modern creative leaders as um, the fact that we believe that we are experts. Being an expert is the beginning of the end because when you are and when you think you are an expert, you think you know everything about something and you, know, and you don't need to learn anymore. Instead, children, of course, having not matured any experience, are always in the learning mode. And this is the attitude that we should have uh, in the business nowadays. It takes a lot of humility, it takes a lot of effort, but uh, it's certainly the right direction. Now, um, before uh, drawing any conclusion, I want to take a look at how agencies try to react in terms of structure to the new media era. So, uh, I'm uh, bringing forward the, the two uh, most talked about examples in the last decade, probably, which are the alphabet agencies in Le Burnet that uh, Michael knows very well, and uh, the virtual agency in Chaya Day in Los Angeles. These are two attempts that these agencies tried to put forward in order to respond to the new media era. Were they successful? No. But uh, uh, there are some learnings there for us in, uh, in putting forward a new solution. Now, um, one of these examples is Le Burnet. In 1994, uh, things were not going very well. The agency was under bad karma. And in order to make the agency quicker on its feet, the decision was to, was to try and divide the, this mastodontic agency in seven little agencies, so mini agencies with a 
accounts, creatives, planners, and any, every one of these agencies was uh, called with a letter. That's the name of the project, Alphabet Agencies. Um, well, at first, the, uh, this is what I read, the, the, it was very well received by the community and the agency was able to even regain a couple of clients, one, one of them being uh, Heinz Tomato Ketchup, I, I believe. So, you know, it really worked. But eventually, the other clients started to get frustrated about it and in 1999, it was phased off. The other example, for me somehow a little bit more interesting, is the virtual office. This was a big hit in 1994 or 97, I think. I don't know, I'm not too sure about the year. But uh, Child Day put forward this new structure, uh, starting from an insight. The uh, physical space to work in is not needed anymore. So every creative of the agency was given a mobile phone and a computer, and they could go and work wherever they wanted, in a park, at home, and they could just connect and come to the famous binocular Fangieri uh, building for meetings and for presentations. Uh, again, this was, was very well received uh, at the time because it was a fascinating approach, you know, almost a futuristic one, but in the long run also didn't work. And I think it didn't work mainly because it's important to uh, feel the proximity of the people that work in your team, you know, otherwise aseptic uh, environments are not good uh, for creating ideas. These are just two examples. Um, let me put forward what my possible solution is. Is this the solution? No, this is just a starting point, an experiment. But maybe starting from here, we can find new ways. Uh, the act, the very act of abstracting ourselves from the daily grind and thinking about a solution is already a step in the right direction. And this is not just a theoretical approach because I am applying this structure to the Milan office and uh, I'm, I'm optimistic about how the results could be. Here here is briefly how it is. I imagine an agency based on labs. Uh, every lab takes care of a category depending on the clients of the agency. For instance, we have uh, the food lab, the tech lab, the finance lab, the beauty lab, and every lab is composed by a team of cre integrated creative people but also planners and accounts. Everybody participates, everybody sitting in the same space learning the lesson from the virtual office. So every lab has a head and in this metric structure as you can see the executive creative director and the head of planning take care of the coherence of the work. Um, this is a, I think a great way to bring up an added value for big networks because the problem is that we have a lot of boutique uh, blossoming and the boutiques cost one tenth of a big agency so uh, if we start to believing that knowledge can be the added value I think it's the right direction so these people devote part of their time at work to become really expert about these fields so for instance uh, talking about food people who work in the food lab will know everything about the latest trends in food about the best directors and photographers about the, the, the newest case histories and inventions um, they would really bring an added value imagine when you tackle a new business and you sit down with a client, with a prospect client, if you have a team that knows what they're talking about and not a team that uh, learned about the field in the last 24 hours googling stuff like it usually happens, I think this could be very useful. Okay, wrapping up, uh, the other important thing for me is to involve clients because 20 years ago clients didn't even know what was going on in agencies, they, did, they ignored the processes, so people in agencies could really fool around with them a little bit in terms of deadlines and the process and how to uh, produce a campaign. Nowadays they know more than us, so the, instead of looking at this as a problem, let's look at, it, at this as an opportunity, let's involve them, let's have always an empty seat in our brainstormings for them, let's uh, write briefs with them. Not not anymore a marketing brief and then a creative brief. Let's write an inspiration brief, as I like to call it. Um, so this is also very important, involving clients. Now, uh, and this is my conclusion. Uh, of course, uh, the famous Maslow's pyramid is here, and uh, the, the pyramid of human needs. Uh, men go from satisfying their physiological needs to self-actualization. Well, I think that in modern times there's a new phase that we need to add on top of this pyramid because uh, new media require it. And this new phase is ego management. Ego, man ego management meaning uh, horizontalization, teamwork, and, uh, um, and humility. I think this is very important. And when we were in Tokyo and we went to visit the Akuhodo headquarters, it was nice because the presenter addressed to this phase in particular and he called it urge to coexist within the community, which I think is very important. 
So, um, the ego, as we saw, can be really, really uh, a weapon of self-destruction. So I hope that uh, after this presentation or through reading my thesis, creative leaders can get a little help in understanding how to use it instead as a booster for success. Because, as John Hunt said, the bigger the ego, the smaller the echo. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>